Hi, guys. Um, so as already said, I'm Edith. This is Yuval. And we are going to share with you a little bit there uh, about the work that we're doing around eBPF and web proxy and so on. So we're going to get focus on my screen in a second. OK. So first of all, about us a second, I mean, as we say, we are Solo.io. Uh, we are um, an STO provider, uh, and we have a product called Glue Mesh, and we also have an API gateway based on STO. Uh, we are working with the STO community for the last five years. We are, we are helping, you know, the largest deployment of service mesh in the world basically is running by us with our customers. Uh, we have uh, a lot of people in the TOC members, and we, have, you know, we're working hardly with the community and, leader, uh, and leadership there. Um, uh, what we're doing besides, you know, taking SEO and, and, and working with it and making it better, we also kind of like try to push the boundaries. And we're doing a lot of innovation around service mesh, which relations of WASM, web application, uh, 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 web assembly, as well as eBPF, GraphQL, Android, and so on. So whatever we can push, we will push. Uh, uh, we have a very good product. It's win one of the technology of the year. Uh, and we have, as I said, it's not solo, it's not me and you, but solo, it's a big, big team uh, who is expert, and you see some of the people on the, on the right side. So that's kind of like in a world where we're coming and why we're doing what we're doing. But let's talk right now about the subject that we are here, which is the architecture of SDO. So specifically, let's talk about, about you know, why are we using SDO, right? Just kind of like understand what is the thing, the feature that we need to cover. And there's three things that we need to do, right, which is very important. Number one is we need to bring observability, right? So layer four and layer seven. We need to make sure that the traffic is encrypted because it's really important that uh, it will be secure. And then the last and not least thing, we basically need to make sure that we will be able to apply policy on the, on the mesh and on the pipe. We want to do that in layer seven as way as, la as layer four. So stuff like Canary or RBAC or read rise or whatever we want to make sure we want to make sure that we will be able to do so. That's kind of like where we will end, right? Like in a good world, we want to make sure that everything is could be done. So now the question is, how do we do that? And today in SDO, there is this model, which is the sidecar model. And the way it's working is pretty simple. You have, you know, a request. It's going from pet store to reviews. It's going to go first there through the sidecar proxy. It's going to go to the second side of proxy, and then it will finish in the reviews. So now, you know, this is a very valid architecture, but let's, let's understand how it works exactly in kind of like details, what those sidecar is giving us. Uh, and for that, you will share information. Yes. So what we're going to talk about right now is how we answer the requirements of the mesh using the technology of the mesh, right? So as far as L7 and L4 observability, the fact that we have a sidecar uh, Envoy proxy in our in Itzio that understands the L7, kind of decodes all the requests and that can do uh, observability on them, right? Uh, same with traffic encryption, it's combined Itzio and Envoy, right? Itzio can provision a secure workload identities and Envoy can perform MTLS using these uh, certificates to make sure that every network edge is, a, is, is, a, is using encrypted traffic. As far as policy, and here again, the, the ITSEO, the control plane translates user's policy into Envoy configuration, and Envoy applies these policies on the traffic uh, uh, live. So Envoy, and combined with uh, ITSEO D, is, is the core piece that allows us to do all those mesh features today. Yes. And I, I will kind of like want to highlight. So basically, a lot of that functionality is being done by the power of Envoy, which is very, very important. Because the question right now is that, do we need it? And if it's doing a lot of stuff, we need to figure out that we're going to, come, uh, to do it in a different way. So let's figure out if there is any problem with that uh, approach. So there is two problems that we kind of like recognize with the approach of the sidecar. One of them is regarding to the operational complexity. And the, the other one is the, is the cost. So you value talk a little bit about those two. Yeah, in terms of operational complexity, we're now adding another piece of software to every pod in our cluster. 
Um, so in terms of upgrading and keeping track what's where um, and uh, upgrades of the mesh itself, if you in case you're just doing a regular version upgrade for more features or in case you're doing a, an upgrade due to a CVE, uh, now you'll have to upgrade, essentially re-roll every pod in the mesh so it gets the new sidecar. Uh, additionally, the Kubernetes wasn't, uh, when it was built, this use case wasn't taken to full account, so there's some edge cases that don't work fully. For example, a, a job that has a sidecar will not terminate because not, there's some running containers still in the pod. Uh, in addition to operational complexity, we can talk about cost complexity. Adding a sidecar to every mode, uh, every pod and performing the L7 policy does give us all those features we just talked about, but also consumes more resources. So parsing an L7 requests HTTP is a complex protocol. It takes time, right? There's no way around that. So you have one you know, client, one server, it takes around one to two milliseconds on every, uh, every endpoint. And that's even if you don't do any fancy policies. Just the fact that you have to parse and uh, re-encode and decode and re-encode the L7. And of course, in addition to that, uh, Envoy is software and needs the resources, RAM and CPU, and it uses the, those resources separately for every pod in the clusters. Uh, even those pods that are identical, presumably you have very similar things in Envoy's memory. Great. So the question is, can we do it differently? And that's basically what we're going to discuss here. Uh, so, you know, this is an article that came from Cilium. Uh, I think it's by Thomas Graf. And basically, uh, it's talking about two very important things here. First of all, is how eBPF can solve the service mesh. So basically, eBPF technology is relevant here. And second of all, goodbye sidecar, which means that we're going to get rid altogether from the sidecar. So I think there is two separate things here. Number one is the sidecar and the architecture of Festio. And the second thing is the eBPF. There are two separate things that we need to talk about it separately. And I think, I think it's a little bit confusing, the, the ecosystem, because I think the way it's written, it seems that it's kind of like going together, but I don't think that really what's going on here. So let's separate them and start with a goodbye sidecar. So what does it mean, goodbye sidecar? And the mod model that basically being uh, offered is, what if we will put proxy per node, which means not per, per pod, but per node. So in that case, it would be very simple. If you have kind of like uh, you know a request, it will go to this proxy, it will go to the other proxy on the node, and it's going to go to the end. By the way, the same thing will happen if it will go for a different node, right? I mean, it's very very important to say that there is one proxy that being shared on the node. Okay, great. So now again, when we are offering new architecture, it's really just important kind of like to think about what is the thing that we need to deliver eventually, and if there is any problem to deliver, maybe it's not the right suitable one. So just reminder you, right? Layer four, layer seven observability, traffic inscription, and layer four, layer seven policy. So let's talk right now about it and see if there is any problem. Right, so using a proxy uh, per node can help save some of the stuff we previously discussed, but it introduces new problems. Specifically now, all the pods on your node share the same proxy. This proxy actually becomes a multi-tenant proxy. And that brings classic multi-tenancy problems with it. So for example, noisy neighbors, not all workloads will use the same policies that use the same amount of CPUs. So you can have one workload, one pod, that's because the way it's written, because of its traffic patterns, will use a lot more CPU uh, on, on that proxy and degrading the performance of other services you know, owned by separate teams with separate SLAs that all of a sudden need to take to account that another service is impacting their SLA. In addition, extendability here at Solo, we really like WASM uh, and WASM modules that can add a lot of benefits to uh, your specific use case by allowing you to make extensions to Envoy that you own that make your use case um, supported in the mesh, even if it's not uh, going to be added to ETSIO itself because it's not needed by the broad community. Uh, when you insert a WASM module into Envoy, it operates under one 
envoy threading model. And that means that a poorly written WASM module can actually halt the execution of the entire proxy, right? So now if you have a team that wants to deploy an extension, a WASM extension, you depend on that extension being well written and, uh, and if you share the proxy. You yeah. introduce risk with extending. Right. So if someone, for instance, is writing a code, right, potentially, because every team will write their own WASM and loaded it to the proxy, if they can th theoretically take the proxy down. And if they're taking the proxy down, guess what? No network to this node whatsoever. Nothing is accessible. So that's very important thing to understand because you share it, right? So potentially someone that you maybe don't know can take your proxy down and your application will have zero network. And that actually ties well to our next point, because the reason this happens because writing L7 logic is hard. And not only that, securing L7 is hard. Most of the Envoy CVEs, high severity CVEs, happen in L7, right? So not only you need to worry about these extensions, now you need to take into account the threat model that you have a single proxy that can impersonate every identity in the network and you have to make sure that there's no potential L7 issues uh, in terms of your security port posture, right? Because if someone managed to gain access to this proxy, it, it can now impersonate every uh, network node, right? It becomes kind of a critical infrastructure component. And we have to think about that in terms of the, the threat model and our security posture. Awesome. Okay, so there is advantage with this, and by the way, maybe it will work for some people, but th there is some also limited. And honestly, you know, I like to say that this is a very nice approach, and I actually really like people that joining to the community who never done service mesh before, and kind of like giving fresh eyes. This is important, right? So we've never done service mesh before. They wanted to play in the system, which is great, but that means that, you know, maybe they will bring a new, a refreshing perspective, which I actually appreciate that. But actually, it's not that new, right? I mean, if you're looking at the STL community, William Morgan, the person who basically came with the concept of service mesh, right? He was the first one who, who, who came with this word from the LinkedIn Le Le uh, founder. It basically started like this. That was how we started. And we decided to divert to the sidecar. The reason is because there were some problems with security. There were some problems with multi-tenancy that are very, very important to kind of like highlight. So again, there's limited, there's, you know, there is some limitation here that we have to take in consideration. Okay, so let's move to the next thing, which is very, to me, it's even more interesting, right? Is that the eBPF itself. I mean, until now, we didn't talk about eBPF. We just talk about the sightless, right? So basically, can we get rid of the sidecar? That's one subject that's not related to eBPF whatsoever. Now, let's talk about eBPF itself and figure out if we can push it. Can we potentially get rid of the proxy altogether? And actually, this is a, 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 a some uh, tweet that went recently about talking about that really makes sense. This is kind of like the evolution, you know? We started with service machine libraries, right? Kind of like move it to a sidecar model. And the next evolution should be in the kernel like every other technology that we do, which is very, very interesting approach. So let's figure out if we can do that. So, you know, before we talking about it, just kind of like to make sure that everybody's on the same, you know, know everything. You know, what is eBPF? And eBPF is a technology that comes with the kernel, with the new kernel, by the way. So if you all, you're using old kernel, you, you know, you maybe don't have uh, a exposing to all that functionality. But basically, the way they started is, um, is by basically ability to extend the, 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 the kernel. Can we actually, exactly like Wasm is extending the browser and now Envoy, can we use something to extend the kernel? Don't forget that when you want to put something upstream to the kernel, it's taking years. And there is a good, good reason on this because everything is running the kernel, right? I mean, your devices of your iPhone and your, uh, you know, Android, everything basically is operating on a kernel. And therefore, we need to be very, very careful of what is actually being accepted upstream. And therefore, to put something upstream, taking a lot of time. So the idea was... Can we actually ship the kernel the way it is, but give people the ability to extend that and on their own risk, basically, right? Okay, so if we want to extend exactly like in Wasm or in other, other technology, we need to make sure, first of all, that it's safe. Specifically, and that's really, really important on the kernel because it will take the kernel down. There is no compute. Anymore. You're done. 
So it's really, really important, for instance, not to run an endless loop in the kernel as part of this model. Um, it needs to be fast, it needs to be flexible, and so on. The first implementation that actually they were kind of like exploring with this was TCP dump. So if actually you are using TCP dump filtering today, you're actually using DTF behind the scene. So what the idea is, the idea is very simple. Can we actually create some model that basically can be extended in the kernel and we will be able to basically hook it to events that are happening in the kernel. So basically as a service, right? Every time that you know an event happening, a package prop, I want to run this piece of code. Uh, you're doing it on the kernel mode. If what you're doing with this is related to, for instance, say, you know, you wanted to expose some metrics, somehow I need to go to the user. And so it's not a simple thing to do. But again, what is important here that it's have to be extremely safe. It cannot take the kernel down, right? Uh, so that's kind of like very high level of eBPF. Uh, so the question is the way it's built and what it's doing, can it replace the proxy? Can we actually leverage this and write models that basically will do everything that the proxy do it today? So you will will share with you some use cases that we're working for instance with our customer, a very basic one, honestly. And let's see if we can do something like that with eBPF and if not, why? So let's say, uh, let me reiterate some of the points you just mentioned. eBPF is kind of built as an event-based model, right? Usually eBPF programs cannot, um, are invoked by the kernel at a certain hook point, right? They cannot, um, they're not a program that can just start and execute logic, right? And in addition to that, they are verified to terminate, which means they're not Turing complete. The kernel has to know that the, the eBPF program will terminate at a specific time, right? And create, implementing sophisticated L7 use cases becomes very hard under these limitations. So we just give here a couple of use cases that we see very common across the board with our customers, uh, JOTs, for parsing JOT, routing based on a JOT, becomes something very hard to do uh, with eBPF. Things like external auth, where you have a request, you need to pause the request, go out to an external service, get a reply, and then decide where or not to let the request continue. Something's very hard to do with eBPF. Um, something like advanced load balancing where you have to uh, pair request, parse it, and then on that specific request, decide to which backend to send it also becomes a bit hard to do in eBPF because you, when you do that, you have to kind of re-encode the upstream HTTP request. You can't just take the existing packet and just send it upstream, especially with HTTP2, a stateful protocol. Uh, those things are, are less natural to create with eBPF today. Yes, and, and, and there, it, it's, we're not saying that this is something that cannot be done ever. The only thing that we're saying is that we need a lot of sp more support from the operating system uh, and library that I'm not sure that is upstream right now. Um, so just, just going to take a little bit time, uh, or maybe I will say a lot of time. Um, but, but, but a lot of use cases, and we just... Honestly, one of the most common and simple one that we have with our customer becoming extremely uh, uh, hard. Can you do stuff on HTTP2? Yes, right? Maybe specific metrics, if you will, really parse that, but that's metrics that's really, really far from the actual use case that people running in production um, or our customer at least running in production, and we have quite a lot. Uh, the second thing that I will say, you know, HTTP2 is complex. Good luck with HTTP3. So the point that I'm trying to make is it's, it's, there is a lot more work to do and a lot, a lot more work to do in order to be able to do that. So again, the question is, can we get rid of the proxy? Honestly, I don't think so. It's not right now. I mean, yeah. definitely not in the, in, in, the long, in the short future. So now the question is, is that mean that eBPF is not a relevant technology for the service mesh? And no, it's definitely relevant. So let's figure out about some stuff that you can do because there is some stuff that you can do. So let's talk about a little bit about the stuff that we can do. And you, you, I think you will take it from here. Yeah. So we want to show you an example where we can use eBPF to augment the service mesh. So let's talk a little bit, give a bit of a background about networking in ECO and see how we can use eBPF to optimize it. So in general, when a sidecar is deployed to a pod, ETO grabs the traffic transparently, so the app is not aware of the sidecar, using something called IP tables redirect. 
And here you can kind of see the, the architecture of a, the flow of the packet through IP tables. But the gist of it that transparently we use, uh, we take the uh, packet as it arrives, we grab it using an IP tables redirect, send it to Envoy instead. And then Envoy sends it to the app using regular TCP IP, right? It just kind of opens a connection to the app and sends it. Let's show that. So, yeah. yeah. Let's... So basically, just in a little bit more details. Uh... Yeah. A, a packet comes to the pod. Uh, and what happens in a redirect, right? If the pod port is uh, 5,000 in our case, we'll redirect it to port 15,001. It gets to Envoy. Envoy knows that all traffic on this uh, port is meant for the app. It knows that it got there through IP tables. So it correctly applies app-specific policies and routes it to the app. Um, that, that's it. exactly yes. the information. <laughs> yes. And uh, eventually, once the uh, this is kind of showing the, the other way, once an, an pod tries to go out, also the egress happens through Envoy, transparently sent. Envoy understands where it needs to go and sends it through the regular network card uh, of the pod. Right. Uh, all right. So redirection has been with us for quite some time. It works well. The catch with redirect that we use the network stack a lot, right? So from every time we do a trip from Envoy to the app, Envoy has to send it through the network stack to the app again, in addition to the original time it got there, it plus the other way that when the app sends it to Envoy, it goes through the network stack into Envoy and again from Envoy to the network stack to the rest of the mesh. Now, uh, we can use eBBF to accelerate that, right? We know exactly where those uh, packet needs to go. We know what they're doing. Uh, we know the, the, their sources and the destination. So we can use eBPF to skip the TCP stacks and just send, send these packets directly from one app to another. eBPF has a feature called a SOC map, socket maps, that you can use to just take data from one socket and put it in another socket directly, right? So if we talk about Linux, you have the socket, the application writes data to the socket, from the socket reaches to the kernel and to the TCP stack. So instead of getting to the whole TCP stack, we can just take it from one socket and put it in another socket using eBPF. Yeah, so we should so let's that right now. show a diagram of that. Yep. So, uh, so now when we want to uh, do some uh, traffic, the pod sends traffic to the application. We grab it using eBPF and then directly send it to Envoy. Right? So now. The, the Envoy gets the, uh, the data without going through the network stack. And in a second, we'll show some graph explaining uh, how is that helpful, right? So the whole green path here, we've done without using the network path up until now. And then, you know, as usual, Envoy sends it uh, upstream. Yeah. And we've done some measurements. You can see that we, we get some uh, benefits with latency and throughput. These are the kind of graph. Uh, that we, we generated in our testing. So you can see some improvements in latency. Uh, we use the ETL frameworks to do that. So you can see stats uh, with no BPF and stats with BPF uh, at a thousand requests per second. And this is a P99, similar thing. You see a slight improvement when we use eBPF to, just because we skip network path, right? It's just less CPU is being sent. So we save latency. And Let's talk a little bit about observability. So the mesh Envoy, they provide a lot of observability, right? But, and of course they can be exported to Prometheus and the apps can also export um, metrics to Prometheus uh, and we can all plot them all in Grafana, get some nice dashboards uh, pretty much automatically just by virtue of installing uh, sidecars to our applications. Even if we don't apply any other policy, we get a lot of nice metrics pretty much uh, built in. So in addition to, to graphs, we can also get kind of this observability graph showing the traffic patterns, which pod talks to which pod, 
seeing any errors, what's happening, making sure MTLS is on, kind of nice visualization that we can just get by just using the mesh without any further policies, right? But there are gaps. And here's, let's talk a little bit about those and see how eBPF can help here, right? So the disadvantage of all the nice thing I just said is that you have to have Envoy there, right? Because the proxy is the component that's generating these metrics. So we're limited uh, to uh, workloads that have the proxy and we're limited to metrics that Envoy or Itzio create, right? If you want to customize that, that's a separate uh, thing, right? Uh, and in addition, if we have other environmental issues, sometimes st stuff are related to Linux, it would be hard to diagnose with Envoy metrics, right? If we have an issue with the, you know, TCP buffers, that's not something Envoy can help us because that's the Linux kernel level. BPF, eBPF can definitely help here. It's a natural fit when doing observability. Um, because eBPF is at the kernel level, we can inject the eBPF program to nodes and gather metrics to all the applications that run there, regardless if they're injected with Envoy, with a sidecar or not. So we can capture data using eBPF, get metrics and combining them, uh, exporting them to Prometheus and combining that with Itzio and Envoy metrics, we can get kind of get the best of both worlds, right? We don't have to choose, we can do them both, right? right? So in general, sc when scraping metrics, you can see Prometheus can go to the proxy, uh, get the metrics. In addition, Prometheus can also go to regular applications. Application can also expose metrics. And let's see how eBPF fits in here. We deploy an eBPF program one per node. So each node just gets this program. We just deploy it. It's there. You don't need to change your pods. You don't need to change anything. It's just deployed unrelated to the whole deployment. So far, it has its own life cycle. And then Prometheus can, in addition to scraping Envoy and in addition to scrape the app, it can also now scrape these programs. I'm a bit skimming over the details for, for brevity, but this way you can get metrics from everywhere, right? And in this case, eBPF is a great solution. You don't need to choose. We can create an eBPF program that gives us observability for our entire network, not just our entire mesh. And in addition, some kernel features that Envoy cannot just give us metrics for. Awesome. So, okay, so what, you know, that was kind of like a, a lot of data and I think we're running out of time. We actually wanted to show you an observability demo, but I think we will probably post it somewhere because we don't have that time. Um, so itself, uh, a open source a project called Bumblebee. Uh, that is basically focusing on observability and uh, a, a, in, with eBPF. It's kind of like a docker for uh, eBPF that's helping you to build it and auto-generating your user mode code and so on. So go check it out. It's open source. But um, besides that, let's again kind of like summarize because we have to wrap up here. What is the thing that we talked about? It? So as I said to you, the first thing that we're trying to figure out, and I think this is important, is that are we happy with the current situation of the architecture of SDF? And the answer is like everything in world is that there is a trade-off, right? There is an advantage for sidecar. There is an advantage for proxy per node. And the question is what is suitable for you, right? Now, again, there is some stuff that personally for me, I think that, you know, the security issue that has with the proxy per node and the, the multi-tenancy is kind of like a no, you know, no starter. But, you know, it's an option to explore. And by the way, maybe to take it to the next level. I don't know. Maybe there is a third application. Um, I don't know, but maybe there is a third application that we can explore here. Uh, the second thing that is very important is eBPF can help us. And again, can eBPF can get rid of the proxy? The answer is no, not now, right? Definitely not now. It will take a while until it will. There is a lot of use cases that we will need to, to, to create that are extremely extremely hard to do with eBPF. Um, so that's not going to happen anytime soon, but can we leverage the eBPF technology to basically uh, kind of like supercharge the mesh? And the answer is yes. And we kind of like explore uh, two of the things that we are personally doing, but I'm sure that there will be more and as a community, it's really great to explore that. So that's kind of like in general, like, you know, this is at least our output. We'd love to hear the community, but again, Sidecar is a fair model. You know, that's what's working right now. Uh, proxy per node is limited, but also advantage. Can we get where the third one is interesting? And the last one, can we leverage eBPF kind of like all of this? 
Um, I'm kind of like we'll wrap up just by saying that please reach out to us. I mean, a solo is all about service measures, all about STO. We have a lot of people from the TLC member, the leadership. We are contributing a lot to Envoy and STO. You know, love to get your feedback and share with you what we learned from our customers and the people that are that using STO. Thanks so much.